Good morning. Please turn with me to the 119th Psalm, Psalm 119, and we're going to be reading verses 65 through 72. Psalm 119, begin with verse 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have forged a lie against me. With all my heart, I will observe your precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We ask that you would use it right now to... Change us, Lord, from the inside out. Use your spirit, use your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but I sure do love hymns. It's always such a pleasure to get to sing hymns with you in the morning. You know, whether they're those the oldie but goldies that we can at least remember most of the lyrics to without reading, or if they're new hymns, of which there's plenty out there, as long as they accurately reflect the scriptures, then I just love them. And if you also like hymns, I'm sure you have a favorite. My favorite hymn is It Is Well With My Soul. In the 1870s, a man by the name of Horatio Spafford began experiencing what would prove to be a truly horrific chain of afflictions, of hardships. First, his two-year-old little boy died. And the same year, his family was financially ruined by the great Chicago fire in 1871. That whole economic downturn meant that he had to stay behind and do some extra business, and he sent his family, his wife and his four daughters, across the Atlantic without them. He was going to meet up with them in Europe. On the way across the Atlantic in November of 1873, the ship carrying his family struck another ship, and it went down to the bottom of the ocean. He got a telegram from his wife, and it said two words, saved alone. All four of their daughters had died at sea. Spafford took the journey to meet his wife, and on the way, while he was on that same ocean where his four daughters had died, he wrote the six verses and a refrain which later gained the title, It Is Well With My Soul. He didn't write a depressive song about how he felt, having lost all of his daughters and his son two years before, nor did he complain or even lament their deaths in the hymn. Instead, he wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. And he understood loss, I think you can agree, more than you or I, have, can really imagine. You know, even after this, they had more kids. He lost another little boy at the age of four to scarlet fever. On and on, Horatio Spafford went through this loss, heartache, hardship, affliction, became a way of life for him. Wouldn't you like to be able to respond to hardships the way this man did? Wouldn't you like to be able to hold it together when loved ones get sick or die? Or when financial ruin comes upon you? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could face terrible trials and afflictions and not only hang on to your faith, but grow still more in your knowledge and walk with the Lord? In our passage today, you're going to find out how this is possible. Psalm 119 is the longest recorded psalm in the Bible, and yet it's written by an anonymous psalmist. To say it's written by David would be an assumption there's nothing that indicates it was for sure David, just like there's nothing that indicates it was for sure Ezra or that it was for sure Daniel. All three of those men were men that lived for the Lord. 
So it could have been written by any of them. It could have been written by a completely random guy. And I think that's actually kind of neat that the Lord deliberately did not preserve who the writer is because it allows us to focus more on what the psalm is about rather than on who wrote it in the background. And of course, when he does let us know who wrote a psalm, there's a reason because it does help us with that background information. But in this case, Psalm 119 is all about the word of God. And it's an acrostic poem. And if you don't know what an acrostic is, that's a tick that climbs on top of crosses. No, it's not. Don't worry. An acrostic means it's a poem that uses every letter of the alphabet in the order. And of course, this being Hebrew, if you look down at your Bibles, you're going to go, well, I'm sorry, sir, but that's not happening here. That's okay. This is English. In Hebrew, it does this. There's 176 verses, and it's broken up into 22 chunks of eight verses each. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So they begin with Aleph, which is the first letter, and so on. Every eight verses beginning with one letter, and then you move on to the next eight. Every stanza, a different one. And in your English Bibles, you might see the transliteration of those Hebrew letters at the top. It might be in your Bible. It's in mine. It's in some of them. In others, it's not so much. Um, the idea behind an acrostic poem, why in the world would a poet do this? Well, the reason is because it kind of shows you the A to Z, so to speak, of a subject, right? Everything about it. For instance, Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, is about the excellent wife. Yeah, woo, we'll go read that one, folks. It's a good one. Especially you young men who haven't been married yet. You've got to find one of them right there. That's actually an acrostic poem. It's 22 verses. It each begins with the letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's the A to Z of what is an excellent wife. This is the A to Z of what is God's word. And in our stanza today... Uh, the letter for it is Tafe. Our stand looks like a fish hook that's kind of sideways, a square fish hook that's sideways, so it's pointing up. And there's a little hook going down, um, just to visualize it a little bit. Our stanza today is going to be very similar to the rest in that it's going to have plenty of synonyms for the Word of God. And they all have their different meanings to them precepts and statutes and judgments and commandments and law, which is actually the Torah, the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. Not so much law as in rules and regulations, but more word of God. And you're going to see these synonyms throughout, so note them. You can write them down in your Bible, underline it if you'd like to, whenever you see some of them. That's pretty fun to do. But we're going to see that in this stanza, it's all about affliction and the effects of it on the believer's heart. In Psalm 119, 65 through 72, you will see three blessings of affliction that show how God uses affliction to mature you. Three blessings of affliction that show how God uses affliction to mature you and I. The first one is in the first two verses, and it's an accurate recognition of God's word. The first two verses kind of set the, the, the tone for the entire stanza. It shows the first blessing of affliction, an accurate recognition of God's word. We're going to see in verse 67 that the psalmist has gone through affliction and 65 and 68 is kind of the beginnings of of what happened to him how he came out from the other end so look carefully at this excellent excellent lesson that he learns first he recognizes that god's word is true verse 65 says you have dealt well with your servant O lord according to your word the word of god is true what god's word says is true all the time He recognizes it's not just Yahweh, whenever you see Lord in all caps, that's Yahweh, the covenant name of God. It's a very personal name. He recognizes not just Yahweh has dealt well with him, but he recognizes that God has dealt well with him according to his word. He knows that it's true. He knows that his good dealings with him are exactly what God promised him, and God keeps his promises. His word is true. He also accurately recognizes that God's word teaches wisdom. Look at verse 66. Teach me good discernment and knowledge. Now, in Hebrew, you can see in your Bible, it probably looks like an imperative, right? Like a command. How in the world is a poet commanding God? Well, that's exactly right. Whenever an imperative is used towards God, it's not a command anymore. Instead, it's a begging. It's a pleading. It's an entreaty, especially when it's a divine superior like God. So when he says, teach me, he's he's begging God to teach him good discernment and knowledge. In fact, 
he teaches or he, he begs God to teach him something from his word eight different times throughout the course of Psalm 119. And in other times, it's the opposite. He talks about how he's learned from God's word, and they come from the same word in Hebrew. One of them is the teaching, the other is the learning. There's also a gaining of understanding that is similar to it all throughout this psalm. In fact, you would do well to just take four and a half months and read one stanza each week, and you'd get through all 22 of them in four and a half months, less than half a year. You'll learn something about the word of God. And, and he talks about this teaching, but how does the Lord teach us? How does he do it, church? By his word. Yes? It's already here. It's already done. It's by his word. He's not going to send an angel down to teach you. He's not going to give you a dream or a, a prophet to come up and say that God gave me a new word for you. No, he's going to give us his word, and then he's going to use, raise up men to help explain it, and then, of course, grow you so that you will understand it more and more. The psalmist knows that the word of God is what gives us discernment and knowledge. Knowledge refers to knowing the truth about God, man, life, creation, the future, how we ought to live. Discernment here, some of your Bibles might say judgments, and that's because it's the same word. It's the same thing, the same idea. But don't confuse it with the way that the world uses the word judgment. The psalmist is not begging God to teach him how to arrogantly judge himself better than others. That's how the world, they, they hear the word judge and they automatically think that. No, that's just one way to judge and it's a wrong way to judge. The right way to judge is like when you're driving down the freeway and you look over to the lane and you judge whether you should turn into that lane or not. It's making a decision. It's deciding, is this right or is this wrong? Should I do this or not? What would the consequences of this be? Discernment is like wisdom. It is the right application of knowledge in our lives. Judgment, discernment, discerning the ins and outs of living a godly life. And God teaches us how to rightly judge or discern whether, for instance, those who are proclaiming to teach God's word are actually preaching his word or they're preaching false doctrine. He uses God's word to teach us how to discern whether a thought or a word or an action of ours would actually be pleasing to him or whether it would grieve the spirit he uses god's word to teach us spiritual maturity necessary to actually apply the knowledge that he's giving us the knowledge that he has given us to our lives so he's accurately recognizing that god's word is true that god's word teaches wisdom but then he also accurately recognizes that god's word is trustworthy and that's in the rest of verse 66 right he says teach me good discernment knowledge why for I believe in your commandments. There's a trust there. Not only is God's word true, but it's so true and so pure and so inerrant that you can actually trust it. You can bank your life on it. It's a foundation for you. It's such a wonderful statement. It's simple, but it's profound. The words contained in this book can be counted on. They can be believed in. They can be applied to our lives, and they ought to. This book is not made by man. It's made by God through man. And since it is made by God, it is true. And since it is true, it can be trusted. When was the last time, ask yourself, when was the last time that you viewed God's word as being true and trustworthy? Are you doing that on a constant basis? Are you trusting in God's word because you know it to be true? And if you do, if you do trust wholly in God's word and not your own ability and power, then when was the last time that you begged God to teach you good discernment and knowledge? Not just a cursory one-minute question in a prayer, but actually begging him to teach you, to override our human frailty and teach us his word. When's the last time that you actually pleaded with him, as the psalmist does, to allow you to rightly understand his word, both on an intellectual level, but also on an experiential level? To not just know what the words say, but to rightly live them out. If you're receiving some sort of affliction in your life right now, some level of suffering, or you just went through some, and if that's not the case, then get ready, because some's coming towards you. 
The reason may be because God wants you, wants to cause you to become like the psalmist and accurately recognize his word to be true, to be one that teaches wisdom and to be trustworthy. And this is that first blessing of affliction here in Psalm 119, 65 through 66. The second blessing, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on this because there's a lot of layers to it. But the second blessing that he talks about here, this isn't the second blessing that the uh, Methodists believe in, don't worry. That second blessing thinks that you can become perfect in this world, which we cannot. (laughs) That glorification happens later. So this is a second blessing of affliction. Please don't think I'm getting my theology goofed up here. But in this stanza, he then says in verse 67 and then 68, 69, 70, and 71, he takes five verses to mix together explanations and promises that show that affliction is going to bring us an appropriate response to affliction. When we go through hardships, we are, if we submit to God through them, we come out the other side knowing how to get through them better next time, how to respond better next time. God uses suffering and hardships to drive you and I to respond appropriately to that suffering, to those hardships. And he takes us through three different phases. He takes us through past afflictions, present afflictions, and future afflictions. And the past afflictions are in 67 and 68. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Now, that word afflicted has the idea of being forced to suffer. Wasn't the psalmist's choice. He didn't choose to suffer. It was forced upon him. And the reason for it is found in the second half of verse 67. Excuse me, yeah, right at the, at the very beginning of it. Before I was afflicted, what was the case? What does it say? I went astray. Now, in the original Hebrew, this phrase has the sense of describing a characteristic pattern. So the psalmist is kind of saying, I was one who went astray. That was characteristic of me, the psalmist says. That was characteristic of me. I was one who went astray. Before he ever became afflicted, the psalmist had the characteristic of going astray. And what's really fascinating about this is that when you and I today hear the words going astray, we immediately think of sheep. Okay, I was going to say sin, but that's good, true, because we are sheep. That's right. We think of sin. We think of when we sin and we walk away from God. But this going astray here, is actually not referring to purposeful sin, but rather to inadvertent error, to actions that were not at the time obvious sins to the psalmist. Why is that so important? Why are we focusing on that right now? Because it shows us what God's view of sin is and what His response to it is. You see, God is so holy so totally set apart from sin that he cannot even tolerate accidental sin. He cannot even tolerate someone inadvertently going astray. This total holiness of God is what prompted the Apostle Paul to say in 1 Timothy 1, 12-15, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. And here he's talking about the mercy to actually be used in the service, not the mercy towards uh, being saved, because every sin is covered by that. But he's saying, yet I was shown mercy to be used as a servant of God to go to the Gentiles because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. With the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. All sin is terrible in the sight of God, including inadvertent sin. And yet all sin can be forgiven by God. If one is truly broken and contrite, confessing such sin to him, and repenting from it, fleeing from that sin. So the psalmist's sin is what led to his affliction. And then verse 68 talks about his response to this affliction. He declares that he's a much different man now, right? 
The end of 67 says, But now I keep your word. But now I keep your word. I was one who went astray. That was characteristic of me. But now I keep your word. And again, this is characteristic. It's not saying that he's perfect. It's not a continuous. It's not always happening. But he is, it's characteristic of him. He is above reproach if we were to use New Testament language. He can go out and nobody's going to be able to stick a sin on him because he's living a characteristic life. He's constantly going before the Lord and seeking forgiveness of sins, of thoughts, of words, of actions. He's keeping his word. And the idea of keeping something is that you would guard it, that you would protect it, that you would hold fast to it. The thing you keep is precious in your sight. When you put your little infant into a big old car seat that's got all this cushion and you strap that sucker down tight, you're keeping him safe. You keep what's precious. You hang on to it. And you make sure not to lose it or forsake it. And that's what the psalmist can confidently say that his life is now indicative of. The psalmist repented of going astray. There's no other way that he could now say, but now I keep your word. He repented of going astray. God showed him grace such that he confessed and fled his sin and is now in a right relationship with the Lord. And when he looks back on that affliction, he declares his repentance, his refocus on the Lord. He looks back and he praises God in verse 68. You are good and do good. Amen to that, right? Is God not good? Does he not always do good? He sure does. He doesn't complain. The psalmist doesn't complain about the affliction. He doesn't try to find a way around it. He doesn't, you know, just stand his ground and unmoved to, to repentance by the affliction. He doesn't try to argue that he didn't deserve it in the first place. No. He declares to God, you are good and do good. And he's making a contrast between himself and God because he uses the same type of structure in Hebrew that he just said, I was one who went astray. That's what, I was, that's what my life was characteristic of. It's the same thing here. It's you are good and one who does good. One who does good. That is characteristic of God. And in God's case, it is continuous because he is unchanging. He is holy and unfailingly so. The psalmist contrasts himself with God. His appropriate response is to repent from that affliction, to praise God for that affliction, to snap him out of that sin, and then to next ask him that he would teach him more. He begs God yet again. The end of verse 68, he begs Yahweh to teach him his word, to teach him God's statutes. Psalmist knows he can't just move on from this experience and forget what he's learned. He can't just once again, try to live life in his own understanding and might, he must keep coming back to God's Word to continue to grow and mature spiritually. We see now that he is dependent on the Word of God. And this continues to the present life of the psalmist. 69 and 70 is the present life of the psalmist. Look what he says. The afflictions didn't end, did they? The arrogant have forged a lie against me. Boy, I love the language used here. Because forged is maybe a more antiquated word. The idea here in the Hebrew is a smearing. A smearing. You guys all know what it means to smear something. Like taking paint and smearing it all over a fence. Or when your little boys are outside and they've got a water hose and dirt and they're going to smear mud all over their clothes. Yes? Smearing. And what is the psalmist smeared with? A lie. They're painting a lie on him. These arrogant, prideful, sinful, evil men are painting a lie on him. They're slandering him. They're smearing him. Do you know what that feels like? Have you ever had someone smear you with a lie? Look at the psalmist's reply. The arrogant have forged a lie against me, and the next part doesn't even need the word but. That's why it's not there. Because he is so different now that he's repented and he's walking right with the Lord. He's so different from them that he can just say, you know, the arrogant have forged a lie. They've smeared me. With all my heart, I will observe your, pre your precepts. That's what they're doing. I'm over here. I don't even have to tell you, but 
it's so completely different. Yes? If you were to say my favorite color is blue, you don't then have to say, but, my, but, but I don't like red. Obvious. Your favorite color is blue. They're totally different. He's saying that, that he's going to promise to observe the precepts, that he will obey God's word. Again, no complaint there. Do you notice that? He's not asking that, that God would end the affliction quickly. He just says, that's what they're doing. But God, I promise to observe your word. And then he switches back to describing them some more. And another so good phrase, so good phrase. When I read this, I'll bet your minds went, what in the world? And that's what I said. Their heart is covered with fat. What in the world does that mean? Do these guys need to uh, lay off the bacon and mayonnaise? Is that what's going on here? You know, hey, maybe. He's not saying that that's not the case. There were definitely very corpulent men in uh, ancient times as well. But that's not the point of what he's saying. This is a, a Hebrew metaphor, an idiom, for describing someone who is unthinking and unfeeling. If you've ever worn one of those sumo suits before, I did so one time in high school against my principal, and that's a story for a different time. But if you've ever worn one, you know that someone could come up to you while you're wearing this sumo suit, and they can just haul off and sock you as hard as they can in the gut. And if you really, you know, weren't, weren't looking at them, you wouldn't really notice it. You wouldn't really, not only did it didn't hurt, but even more so, your, your, your mind's not even focused on it. Whatever. Not a big deal. That's the same idea here. You see, these slanderous lying men had fat around their heart. And in Hebrew, the heart is the seat of consciousness. Okay, same with Greek, actually. So when you're reading the Bible, if it says heart, it's talking about thinking. And if it says, you know, emotions, it's talking about the bowels, which is where the seat of emotion is. That's where you get the, you know, the butterflies in your stomach and you get all the stress and everything. That's, that's why they called it that. That's the seat of emotion in their way of thinking. So when he says heart, he's not talking about the unfeeling part so much. It's more that they don't even care what harm they're causing him. They don't even think about it. They just do it. They got fat around their heart. Their mind has been seared to the point that it's just cushioned from what they're doing. But again, look at the contrast here. And the but is added. Again, there was no but in the Hebrew. The English authors just wanted to make sure that we understood there was a diversity. It's probably not necessary because their heart is covered with fat. I delight in your law, in your Torah, which was an idiom for the Bible. How cool that he's able to say, this is what they're doing, but I'm here, Lord. This is what they're doing, but I'm here, Lord. This is what's indicative of them. They can't even care about me. Yet I, I delight. I delight. I delight in your word, God. In the middle of this affliction, he still delighted. Nothing was more exciting, more invigorating, more joyful and comforting than God's word. And the same is true today, beloved. Even here, halfway around the world, thousands of years removed from when and where this was written, we can and should delight in God's Word. And then Psalmist moves on in verse 71 and starts speaking of the future. All of these past and present afflictions and trials and what he's learning and the growth that's happening, the maturity, he's now able to look forward and actually say that it's good whenever this happens to me. In English, it kind of sounds like it's past tense. It is good for me that I was afflicted. But really the sense is it, is, it, it is good for me when I am afflicted. In other words, I was afflicted, and I'm being afflicted, and I'm pretty darn sure that I'm going to be afflicted in the future. And it's good for me, is what he's saying. It's good for me. What a wonderful response. I mean, listen to that. It is good for me that I was afflicted. It is good for me when I am afflicted. Are you kidding me? This is an absolutely insane statement from the viewpoint of the world. No right-thinking person would ever welcome affliction. It's preposterous. The world's about not getting afflicted about having everything we need to be comfortable and happy. And don't let anybody say anything that might make me feel sad. That's evil of them. But the psalmist says this is a good thing. 
This is a good thing. Let me tell you, church, only a right-thinking person can both welcome affliction and know why it is good for them. Only a person who is saved from their sin and desires to live for the Lord and is now earnestly seeking to obey Scripture out of love for God, only such a person can receive hardship and say, it is good for me. How can it be true? Why would affliction be good for us? The rest of verse 71 tells us that I may learn your statutes. Why is affliction good? Why are hardships good? Why are bad things good for us when they happen to us? Not that we would engage in it, but they would happen to us. Why? Because God uses it to help sanctify us, to help us learn and grow to mature spiritually. And you see that theme, teach me, teach me that I may learn. Same word being used in each, just in different ways. For the psalmist and for the Christian today, this is what we should desire, to grow in the likeness of Christ. James 1, 2 through 4, James says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because those trials produce endurance, steadfastness, patience in us. Maturity comes. Let me ask you, what's your response to affliction? What's your response to hardship? Are you thanking God for using it to discipline you? Are you standing firm on the foundation of Scripture and not giving in to temptation, not repaying evil for evil? Are you looking forward to future? This is the hardest one. Are you looking forward to future affliction that you may learn and grow more in the Lord? So far, the psalmist has shown us that blessings from affliction in his life include maturing him to accurately recognize the Word of God and maturing him to appropriately respond to hardship when it comes. The third blessing of affliction comes in the form of an accepting reverence of God's Word. An accepting reverence where you both accept and revere God's Word. And that's in verse 72. The psalmist begins by saying that God's word is good to him again. And actually in 71 and 72, in the original text, they begin the exact same way. They say, good to me. So in 71, good to me that I was afflicted. 72 begins with, good to me is the law of your mouth. They begin the same way. So there's a parallel between them. Notice though, this this really kind of boggled me. Notice, what does he say? Does he say your law? Verse 72, what does he say, church? He says, the law of your mouth. That's way different than earlier when he said your law. Same word, Torah, right? The first five books of the Bible, okay, Genesis through Deuteronomy, that you have as the kind of stand-in for the word of God along with the other synonyms that we've seen today. But he says the law of your mouth instead of simply your law. Why? This is deliberate. The Holy Spirit inspired this man to write this. This isn't a throwaway. This is important. And here's why. Here's why he makes a difference. First, by calling God's word the law of your mouth, what is he doing? He is drawing attention to the fact that God's word is indeed the word of God. This, the Bible, isn't something that was made up by man. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 tells us that all scripture is inspired by God. And in Greek, that word inspired is literally God-breathed. God-breathed. The Bible is God-breathed. Yes, we have a translation into English. Thankfully, praise the Lord for those men who were persecuted to death just to translate this into what we could read. But the original manuscripts, the original autographs were God-breathed. It wasn't just your law wasn't just your word, O oh God. It's the word from your mouth. It's the word from your mouth. It's breathed out by God through human writers. And second, in addition to confirming that, is that by calling God's word the law of your mouth, the psalmist is drawing a contrast with those slanderous, fatty heart men. Isn't he? Because how do people smear somebody with a lie? How do they do it? Today they do it on the internet. They didn't have that back then. How did they do this? With their, talk to me, with their mouths. That's right. In contrast to the present enemies of the psalmist who are slandering him. Remember, this is, that was going on in the present. They were slandering him with their mouths. 
God has used his words, his mouth, to provide his word, which is perfect and pure and does not slander. It does not lie. It edifies. It builds up those who are saved and trust in him. God has provided this through his mouth so that the psalmist and you and I could be taught and rebuked and corrected and trained and comforted and made wise today. And the rest of verse 72 shows how much the psalmist truly treasures God's word, right? I mean, when you say that the law of your mouth is better to me, so it was good to me is your law, even more than, okay, so the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. That's like all the money in the world for them back then. He's saying that, that God's word is so good to him that he considers it better than anything else. Nothing could be more valuable to this man than God's word. Tell me, do you, sitting here today, do you value the word of God like this psalmist? Do you not only think well of God's word, but also treasure it as this psalmist does? If anything is more valuable to you than the word of God? Is that true of you? If that's the case, I would urge you to reconsider your priorities. Don't place your priority on the things of this world. Rather, treasure God's word. Treasure it in your heart. You know, when Horatio Spafford wrote that hymn, he really showed how God-centered his view of affliction was. Listen to what he wrote, and remember, he just had all four of his daughters die, and two years before, his little baby boy two years old, died. Listen to what he writes. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Can you say those same things today? Are you sure that Christ has shed his own blood for your soul? Can you honestly say that your sin is nailed to the cross and you bear it no more? Can your soul praise the Lord? Can you look forward to the day when Christ returns with joy and certainty, or are you unsure what will happen to you that day? A Christian is someone who has been saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. A Christian is not somebody that marks a little dot on their papers that says, yes, I'm a Christian. No. A Christian is someone who has been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period. And if that's not true of you today, and I would urge you, recognize that you cannot save yourself from sin. You cannot confess your sins to the Lord. Repent, turn away from those sins before they drag you to hell or eternity. Trust in Christ's work on the cross to be enough to save you from your sin and be transformed by God through His Word and His Spirit. Do not delay. Trust in him this very day. And this peace and this joy and assurance and growth that the psalmist had and what old Horatio Spafford had will be yours this very day. And if you are a Christian, then the time for complaint about affliction and stress from affliction and arguing against it and wishing for it to end and defending yourself during it is over. Let us be like the psalmist, you and I, old Christian. Let us thank God for the blessings of affliction. Let us accurately recognize God's word for it being true, for it being what teaches us, and for it being trustworthy. Let us appropriately respond to suffering with humility, repentance, steadfastness, and anticipation for the sake of spiritual growth. And let us accept and revere God's word as the very word of God indeed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much very much for this day. We thank you for the affliction that you send each and every one of us as a means of disciplining us and causing us to repent of our sin and turn to you. 
Oh God, we thank you for giving us your word which tells us how to respond to such affliction. And we beg you, Lord, that if there are any here who have not responded the way that you have said in your word, they have not confessed their sin, trusting in Christ's work on the cross and repenting of that sin, we ask that you would just regenerate their hearts right now. We pray that you would just have them stay around and talk to Pastor Albert about that. And Lord, for those of us who are in the fold, we know you've saved us. Please change us with what you've taught us today from your word. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace for sending us your son, Jesus Christ, to save your chosen ones from our sins and to call the elect to you. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be desist, church. Have a great day.